Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to this session on Hannah Arendt and the Humanities. <clears throat> My name is David Roderick. Uh, I am a philosopher and an artist, and I teach here in the college for many years. And among many classes that I teach, one of my most favorite is to teach philosophical perspectives in the humanities to first quarter freshmen, who, as we all know, are the best. <laughs> and a lot of this project, this book I've written on uh, Hannah Arendt and education and judgment, was deeply influenced by my, my experience teaching uh, philosophy to freshmen. As a brief introduction, um, time myself here. Um, the last time I spoke at Humanities Day was on 2014 when uh, I discussed the question of why art matters to the humanities. Uh, this talk was one consequence of a project that has obsessed me for the, the last dozen years or so, which is to try to define and develop what I call a philosophy of the humanities. Many of my colleagues consider this idea rather strange, <laughs> that one should I mean, isn't philosophy itself a philosophy of the humanities? Perhaps. The humanities contain a great variety of disciplines, methods, and vocabularies that comprise an almost indescribable whole that is constantly changing. Now, despite their own great variety, the physical and biological sciences lay claim in their different ways to a common form of investigation and explanation that is often called the scientific method. But, this is, but is this the only legitimate way of pursuing knowledge? And should the sciences and the humanities aim uh, at knowledge in the same way and with the same means? Or might we follow the great philosopher G. H. von Richt, who's kind of my lotus stone, who uh, writes that the phenomena which the humanities study have features of their own which distinguish them logically from the typical objects of study in the natural sciences. A primary task of a philosophy of the humanities is to try, and cap to try to capture and do justice to those features. The sciences are characterized by a methodological unity whose reasoning is dominated by causal explanation and the discovery of facts or laws that are not open to human introspection. You can't imagine them. You have to go find them in nature. The humanities, however, are a messier business. My picture of a philosophy of the humanities is not guided by the search for a method or a universal program of evaluation or interpretation. Its results will produce nothing that could be consistently applied in the form of methods or criteria guiding the interpretation of texts, objects, or experiences. In this way, I want to speak of a philosophical education in the humanities, not in terms of canons, methods, or disciplines to be mastered, or even knowledges and skills to be acquired and transferred, but rather as something deeper and more fundamental. The continuous forging of a revisable moral life, guided by reason, in open and contingent subjective, intersubjective conversations with others. Or in other words, the humanities, in its deepest sense, conceived as a lifelong education in judgment. In my new book on Hannah Arendt, I hope to show uh, that the practice of judgment is the Ariadne's thread that guides and links all the otherwise divergent disciplinary endeavors of the humanities. What does judgment look like? In the past 17 years, one of my greatest pleasures has been to teach full or part-time in departments of studio art. A central component of creative arts education is what is called the studio crit session, <laughs> criticism, studio crit session. These critical, these critical response sessions can take many forms. However, the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Chicago has developed a format that I find to be particularly instructive. MFA critiques at Chicago <clears throat> are an all-day affair, and, fac and all faculty and all students are invited to participate. Taking breakfast and lunch together present occasions for collegiality and informal discussion, uh, with, inform with multiple crit sessions taking place in the morning and afternoon. An individual session lasts 45 minutes, and in the first 20 minutes or so, 
the young artist whose work is being evaluated is usually not allowed to speak. But beyond the great pleasure I take in being a member of this community, in the past few years, and unbeknownst to my colleagues and students, this activity has taken on for me an intense ethnographic interest as a model for the practice of judgment, especially at a very local level. Now, I have a very intimidating slide here. I, I do not plan to lecture from it or talk about it. <laughs> but as I, I go on through this talk, there's some vocabulary there that, that might be of interest you can refer to. You, you will not be tested on this material. So. Think then of our community as a kind of polis, a gathering of like minds brought together with a common educational purpose, which disperses again as soon as that purpose is accomplished. This disappearance is not final, however, because the community continues to exist in virtual form, a recurrent possibility ready to be reconvened as need arises. This community is based on qualities of mutual respect and openness to the expressed thoughts and perspectives of others. Everyone is free to express their opinion or not under conditions of equality. These qualities are no doubt important, but what interests me most in the studio critique is the following. We are a perambulatory community and wander from place to place in a directed way to engage with creative works intended to be works of art. Let's say, for example, that a student has created, created a construction in three, dimension, three dimensions, something whose viewing requires the mobility of viewers to regard the work from all sides. It may be, on first glance, I take the work to be uninteresting or unfinished. Poor student. <laughs> but happily, to the extent that the work exists, that it creates and occupies a space of appearance, my perspective is not the, the only one in which it takes on sense and value. Rather, the work's appearing occurs in the dynamic interleaving of multiple perspectives, regarding it from various angles and distances, as well as historical and conceptual frameworks. However, these perspectives only become apparent when my collaborators in criticism publicly disclose their opinions and offer them for agreement and disagreement and possible revision. The formation of this community and its public sharing of opinion and aesthetic experience, no matter how temporary and occasional, is already a precious event worth remarking upon. However, I have left out what is most essential and remarkable about the experience. I see a physical work in space, but at the same time, it occupies my imagination. And as I look attentively and listen thoughtfully to the opinions of others, sudden shifts begin to occur in my own internal perspective. The object itself does not physically change, of course. It presents completely to view all that it has to offer in terms of form, material, shape, color, texture, composition, and so forth. But this does not mean that I or others see everything. There are inevitable gaps in our vision and understanding. Or rather, this is the place to fully recognize how the physical act of seeing is inseparable from imaginative processes of understanding. Indeed, what Kant calls, calls imagination and the operation of reflection. This imaginative reflection is equally informed by my past history of aesthetic experience and my knowledge of the history of art, as well as my present experience of reflecting upon the opinions of others. In offering my views and listening to the contrasting or contrary views of others, I gain new insight and I gain new powers of discernment. In other words, while no possible information has been added or subtracted from the work itself, when artful conversation with others encourages me to frame it in different contexts or to see it from different perspectives, its possibilities of sense and value shift. For me, it becomes a new work. I see it differently. I see the work differently now, and accordingly, I revise my opinion of it. 
The student whose work is subject to critique must also practice the expression and defense of reasons and learn how to explain her or his creative convictions. The student is also learning how to, uh, the stu st student is also learning how to listen and to learn and to better understand how her work might inspire unintended meanings and ethical stances or consequences, or how in the course of time the work may take on meanings and values that are entirely and unanticipated by either the artist or her present community. The work is built with the hand, but its possibilities of meaning and value are shaped by judgment. In the course of conversation, I and others learn from each other new vocabularies, styles of argument, and frameworks for observing and interpreting. The contributions of each, of each participant subtly shift the descriptive language of the community and therefore are ways of seeing and understanding. <clears throat> Together we build a new picture of the object that appears in the overlapping edges of each individual's acts of discursive framing. This is not necessarily a fully consensual picture, an achievement that is rarely possible, but it is a more complete picture uh, that accounts for possible new roots of sense-making and evaluation. And even though these descriptions rarely agree in all points, together they bring otherwise unseen aspects of the object into a common space of appearance that all can recognize. Reflecting on the opinions of my colleagues and students, some aspects of the work recede and others come into the foreground. What was previously non-apparent becomes visible. I may find that the work suddenly acquires new depths of interest and possibilities of pleasure, or decide I have new reasons for disliking it. Both things can happen. Yet, in almost every case, I arrive at new depths of understanding, and I call this learning. <laughs> I assess my own conviction and its reasons, yet accept that I may not have the final say. Uh, each and every one of us are offering judgments of this work that include reasons for our opinions and sense of conviction, but no judgment is final. And in fact, our assessments are continually being revised, individually and collectively, for as long as conversation about the work lasts. You'll figure it out. Stop for a moment to consider some of the key qualities of these acts of judgment. Judgment requires plurality. It has no claim to value or permanence unless shared with others. This plurality appears in a space where each participant grants her or his fellows the freedom to think and to express themselves under conditions of equality. The sharing of judgments requests the giving and receiving of reasons and an open examination of one's convictions. In giving, voice to my, <clears throat> in giving voice to my opinions and making them present to others, I must face them publicly and nakedly, as it were. I test my convictions and assumptions of prior agreement and disagreement, as well as my implied or unarticulated criteria for evaluating and making sense of experience. Uh, the possibility to alter one's perspective and to change one's mind is essential here. Otherwise, the, the power to broaden one's mind and to occupy imaginatively the perspective of others is lost. In sharing my judgments, I have changed, and perhaps the whole community has changed as well. We affirm, and sometimes disaffirm together, the degree to which we are a community of like minds and shared interests. In so doing, commit ourselves to act collectively for the benefit of others who wholly or partly share our sensibilities and in inter interests, and to fight for the right of sharing and revising opinion and in a free and open space of speech and action. The collective studio critique differs from ideal cases of judgment, but those differences focalize what I want to call the educative aims of judgment. 
the first difference, um, <clears throat> the first difference occurs at the, initiate, it, at the initiating moment of judgment, what I have described as close to what Aristotle called the experience of thalmazine, which is usually translated as speechless wonder. We have all had the experience of being stopped in our tracks by the intensity of a painting, of a passage of fiction, poetry, <laughs> poetry, music, cinema, or philosophy, or even news of a political event, uh, leading to intensified perception, and then to a state of apperception, which I call looking, listening, or reading while thinking, all the while sorting out what aspects of the work attract my interest, which is discernment. This kind of aesthetic experience often arises in chance encounters, which Kant, in his great book on the powers of judgment, pictures as a singular encounter with a unique object. In contrast, the studio critique involves a pre-constituted pre -constituted community of teachers and students who have come together in a spirit of care and education. Although it might happen, it is rarely the case that judgments offered in these situations either want or need the universal agreement that most first judgments unreasonably demand. Nevertheless, these judgments are made with sincerity and conviction and follow the need to give voice to the reasons for that conviction and so to test it in a public context. However, in its educative aim, the community solidarity that arises in the sharing of judgments of taste is secondary to another interest, which is to share counsel with the student artist. Some of this advice is certainly practical. Would using another kind of material, altering the composition, reimagining the conditions of display, or constructing on a different scale, enhance the perceptual impact of the work? However, the sharing of judges, judgments might also involve important lessons in history, uh, especially in this example, art history. The no this knowledge is important for its own sake in realizing reasons, as it were, of discovering, communicating, and revising them, when also recovers and reviews their history. This is an idea appealed to an Arendt, but for the most part missing in Kant. Judgments of taste do not emerge from individuals ex nihilo. No matter how singular and subjective the judgment, all reasons appeal to criteria, both personal and collective personal and collective at the same time that emerge from a more or less common stock of critical experience, such as histories of viewing and experiencing, acquired frameworks and contexts for interpretation and evaluation, and learned conceptual inventories. We all carry around these kinds of encyclopedias inside of us. <laughs> One is testing not only one's judgment and values, but also the relevance and power of this stock of experience. At the same time, these history lessons suggest how the sense of the work can shift by clarifying its evident or unacknowledged family resemblances and its genealogical connections to prior works and art historical styles or movements. This is what education and judgment looks like. Our department offers a course on critique, but how can this skill be taught? In fact, it cannot. It cannot be taught. It can only be rehearsed and practiced, and solitary study will not deepen it. Companionship is required for its exercise. As judgment cannot be taught, only practiced, in all essential aspects there is no distinction between teacher and student in the exchange of opinion. In classes where I have derived the most satisfaction, I have learned together with my students, who almost invariably offer new ideas and context for interpretation and evaluation that I had not yet seen, despite long years of research and learning. Something that we are learning together and sharing beyond the content of any given course are not only, the, are not only ideas, but also examples of judgment examples of judgment and how judgment can be practiced concretely. 
Is one example better than another? No more or less so than one opinion is necessarily better than another. For there are no absolute and unchanging criteria that can be appealed to. Perhaps I have rehearsed my powers of judgment for longer than my students. This gives me experience, and perhaps I can pass that experience along by example. But my experience does not make my judgments or opinions necessarily better than those of my students. In every given instance or example, we are all equally exposed to the testing of opinion and to the surprise of an unforeseen idea or argument. There's nothing like the happy accident in a classroom. <laughs> I have said that judgment cannot be taught except through its continual practice. And it may well be the case that when one ceases to practice judgment routinely, its powers decline, like those of a dancer or musician who lose the desire to pursue their art. What can a philosophy of the humanities offer in these situations? If a primary aim is to proffer an education in judgment, then the first task of philosophy, of its philosophy, would be to investigate critically exemplary instances of judgment, to delineate with perspicuity its activity and operations, which is one of the things I'm trying to work through in this chart. Uh, and this is one task I hope to have begun in my book on Hannah Arendt, Judgment and the Humanities. If our powers of judgment can be strengthened, deepened, broadened, and intensified, then a philosophy of the humanities can diagnose those areas in which our powers of judgment have declined, weakened, or atrophied, and offer directions for their exercise and restoration. This experience is messy and governed by few explicit rules. No one is fully aware of engaging in operations of discernment, apperception, insight, imaginative reflection, and acts of revision and self-revision as they engage in the free play of judgments improvisational conversations. Good judgment can be practiced intuitively and thoughtfully without the self-consciousness, reflexivity, and introspection necessary to philosophical investigation. Nevertheless, if a philosophy of the humanities can bring these operations into the full light of comprehension and give them conceptual clarity, then perhaps judgment can be practiced with greater care and self-attention by teachers and students alike. Introspection is a key strategy here, where the thinker reflexively makes account of her or his experiences and activities when making judgments. The educative aim of a philosophy of the humanities is to understand what we do when deploying the operations of judgment and how this understanding might improve our capacity to discern and describe, to understand and evaluate, and to defend our convictions in ways that enhance our solidarity with others. Whatever progress can be made in human reason will inevitably occur in activities of experimentation or trying out opinions, ideas, and arguments in public situations where failure or embarrassment are standing possibilities. I have said that a directive aim of the humanities is to define and describe criteria for evaluating judgments, whether criticizing or affirming them, especially because there are no external standards that assure the quality of our judgments or guarantee their permanence, much less their teachability. Is there a danger of infinite regress in this account? Appeals to reflective judgment are both widespread and common because we are called routinely to make judgments whenever and wherever we need to make sense of and evaluate an action, event, or experience. We are making judgments every day, all day, <laughs> often without thinking about it clearly. At the same time, because judgments are always context dependent and can rely on no absolute external standards, infinite regress is a standing risk. This risk is ever present because in judgments activity of critical evaluation, the standards evoked are as much subject to debate as the opinions expressed and there is no end to this criticism. 
At the end, at the beginning of my book, I note Kant's three questions of urgent concern for humanity. What can I know? What should I do? What can I hope for? Later in life, Kant added a fourth question, which was, what are humans? Or another way to put it is, what does it mean to be human? To actually accept to become human or become more human than you are. <laughs> um, Kant's uh, most focused response to this question, which guided the lectures on anthropology that he offered annually for the last 22 years of his teaching career, are set out in his late essay, Anthropology from a Pragmatic Point of View. This far-raging text offers exhaustive accounts of the physiology and psychology of species humans, but ultimately the question provokes responses that are more ethical than empirical or ontological. Kant was among the first philosophers to imagine becoming human as a direction in species history. That is, you, <laughs> you, you, you don't get to become human just be by, be by being born in the world. It is an ethical practice that one must aspire to. In the preface to the essay, Kant defines anthropology as concerned less with the physiological nature of Homo sapiens than with, and this, these are Kant's words, the investigation of what the human, as a free acting being, makes of himself, or can and should make of himself. The investigation of what the human, as a free acting being, makes of himself, or can and should make of himself. This knowledge is speculative in nature, and its pragmatism limits philosophy to establishing certain facts of the human. That human that humans are beings endowed with the capacity for reason and moral self-legislation, that they exhibit a sense of common community defined paradoxi paradoxi paradoxically by what Kant calls their asocial social, social ability. They can't help but be friends and they can't help but fight at the same time. <laughs> asocial sociability. And that they're in their capacity to exercise judgment they express a need for the free and public exercise of thought and opinion. In this context, certain questions of existential import inevitably arise. What can I know of myself and others? What should I do to enhance my possibilities for achieving the human? What is my hope for a new life shared with others in a newly interconnected global existence? pages. Um, without certain knowledge of the next world, what hopes do I have for myself and others in this world? Humans are creatures who, whether instinctively or willfully, design their lives by engaging these with these questions. And it is Arendt's contention that if judgment is closely associated with politics, then all of these questions seek avenues of response based on the con the condition of plurality, that is, collective life. That is, considering human perfectionism as a collective project, regardless of its checkered history, that includes as many abject failures as successes. In its educative aims, Kant's pragmatic anthropology promotes knowledge of the human being as a citizen of the world. Again, that's Kant's phrase, knowledge of the human being as a citizen of the world, or at least a creature with the capacity to become such a citizen. However, it is also clear from Kant's uh, political and historical writing that achieving the human is an unfinished project, and therefore the human is something of a moving target as a subject of philosophical investigation and ethical direction. One can imagine that becoming human is something that may never be fully or finally achieved. Yet it persists as a perfectionist aim for all who can imagine it or be educated toward it. The most one can claim for it is the definition of an idea or an ideal of the human as the ever receding horizon towards which this speculative philosophy directs itself. Kant conceives this project as a direction in cultural history that is often detoured, 
stymied or even reversed. It is a difficult path where some progress has been made, but whose endpoint is still so far distant as to be barely visible. Yet, if philosophy can imagine humanity's becoming, this means at least that we are on the path, no matter how badly marked, neglected, or uncultivated. Arendt and Kant try to identify and examine the nature and consequences of failures of reasoning and ethical unresponsiveness as roadblocks, roadblocks on this path. The problems of our many failures of reasoning and ethical unresponsiveness to others. In this approach, an idea of the human only becomes apparent in its failures, which may often have catastrophic consequences. I need invoke no <laughs> recent examples which are all on our minds. I will suggest an alternative approach in a moment, but in each one of these instances, human powers of judgment must come to our aid. Hannah Arendt has offered some of the clearest examples of human failing while describing their consequences with clear vision and courage. The most, the most infamous case of failure is illustrated in Arendt's account of Adolf Eichmann's sins of conformity to ideology as characterized by his lack of imagination, his failures of thinking, and the atrophy of his moral reasoning and his capacity to judge. Lest one believe this is a unique case, in her essay, Truth and Politics, Arendt also examines the nihilism of the political liar, who ruthlessly exploits the contingency of facts and the instability of truth. Again, I, need, I don't need to outline any specific examples. And in the crisis in culture, Arendt worries about not only a certain Philistinism, but also a barbarism that I read as meaning the risk of becoming uncultured, uncivilized, being uncivil, or not open to conversation and the revision of belief and moral attitudes. In other words, of being impervious to both self-examination and external persuasion. Responding to the crisis in culture is not about making better works of art or learning how to preserve them, but rather changing the terms of our relationship to art and the conversations we have about it, which actually are models for all conversations we have about value. Yet, <coughs> excuse me, yet there is a deeper sense at stake. In a lecture on Socrates, Arendt writes that, this is a quote, a life without thinking is quite possible. It then fails to develop its own essence. It is not merely meaningless, it is not fully alive. Men who do not think are like sleepwalkers." Unquote. These somnambulists have not fully embraced or simply ignored their capacity for becoming human. Nevertheless, in these near hopeless situations, where critical thinking, whether private or public, falls into deep slumbers and atrophies from lack of exercise, Arendt insists that the few who continue to think and to reason become political actors, such that the very act of thinking becomes a kind of act of resistance that displays a human need for reason and the public expression of opinion that cannot be um, suppressed. As importantly, Arendt also notes that even the political liar displays a fundamental human attribute. He is exercising his freedom to change the world, even if the consequences for the rest of humanity are disastrous. This contingency of facts that circumstances could have been otherwise is an affirmation of human freedom. The deep ethical question then becomes, what kind of world do I hope for? And how do I exercise my freedom to imagine and to achieve that world? And how do I persuade others that it is a better world? I have said, and I'm getting close to the end now, I have said that when teaching in the humanities, I have said that when teaching in the humanities, both teacher and student learn together and share beyond the content of, and share beyond the content of any given course, examples of judgment and how judgment can be practiced concretely. These import, this, the important question embedded here is, what does exercising judgment educate us to? 
Every occasion to exercise humanistic reason, reasoning, whether inside or outside of the classroom, is an opportunity to practice good judgment in a public context. And to practice judgment with others is to bestow the gift of freedom. In ideal situations, the public practice of judgment is an opportunity to learn how to accept and exercise one's freedom to think and to speak and to feel that freedom in solidarity with others. In this case, the classroom can function as something like a utopian space that hosts a critical community based on generosity, solidarity, and common care. Education does not mean inculcating knowledge or belief, but learning how to judge freely with a capacity for charity and a willingness to alter one's own belief and opinions. One should not ignore that there can be an intense pleasure felt in sharing judgments with others. This pleasure arises in feelings of sociability and solidarity, in the freedom to think and to think differently, to be in communication with others, and to persuade and be persuaded by them as a measure of belonging to the community. In such communities of judgment, one does not have to seek complete and total agreement but rather only feel attuned to the modes of reasoning and patterns of coming to agreement or in disagreeing that, w excuse me, but rather only feeling attuned to the modes of reasoning and patterns of coming to agreement or in disagreeing that one is speaking and listening on the same terms. Nowadays, this kind of seemingly intangible knowledge is widely treated with suspicion especially by worried parents and administrators of our increasingly financially distressed institutions of highly, higher learning. Today, as in Arendt's time, universities are increasingly dominated by professional schools, the natural sciences, and technology and engineering, all of which are fundamental research endeavors, of course, yet all of which traffic in certainty, quantitative methods, metrical verification, and so-called transferable knowledge. This is the nature of their economic and social utility. Yet this professionalization of knowledge, whose institutional organizations and value structures are so close to the ends directed and utilitarian demands of corporatism and capitalism, have little or nothing to do with the practice of judgment. Does, edu does education and judgment have no role in the modern university then? In moments of despair, there is certainly doubt, giving rise to multiple reports about the crisis in the humanities and the erosion of their support um, in many academic institutions. However, and this is Arendt's central point in mind, there is no democracy without impartial and independent criticism, testimony, and the exercise of good judgment. In this respect, Arendt states that while no one will deny the myriad positive accomplishments of the sciences and professional schools, their importance is not political. Rather, history and the humanities are politically of far greater relevance because their aim is to discern, define, preserve, and interpret factual truth as expressed and transmitted in the documents of culture. For example, Arendt's essay on truth in politics stakes out the position of the citizen witness and historical observer who must negotiate a place that mediates between the uh, celestial truth of the philosopher, the noisy opinions of the rest of us earthly creatures, and the lies and half-truths of politics. The whole argument might be read as Arendt's account of how an education of judgment could serve to enhance One's, uh, one's ability to exercise uh, what Aristotle called phronesis, or political insight, which in her interpretation of Aristotle is a kind of practical intelligence in social and political life, connected to, yet distinct from, the solitary theoretical intelligence of philosophy. And education and judgment aims not only at the cultivation of taste, but also the exercise of practical wisdom, in negotiating, uh, in negotiating the terms for evaluating and revising the factual history of uh, a shared world. 
The ancient Greeks referred to this um, educative um, practice as pedia, which in current times uh, seems newly re relevant. For example, in, 2017, in a 2017 editorial in the New York Times, David Brooks commented, as if in direct sympathetic response to Arendt's essay on truth politics, and this is a quote from Brooks, Paideia is the process by which we educate one another for citizenship. Paideia is based on the idea that a healthy of honorable citizen, that if we are not willing to tell one another the truth, devote our lives to common purposes, or defer to a shared moral order, then we'll succumb to the shallowness of a purely commercial civilization. We'll be torn asunder by the centrifugal forces of extreme individualism. We'll rip one another to shreds in the naked struggle for power. As the brilliant Spanish philosopher Javier Gomez Lanzon reminds us, most moral education happens by power of example. We publish the book of our lives every day through our actions, and through our conduct, we teach each other what is worthy of admiration and what is worthy of disdain. So I come now to my conclusion in that Arendt's essay on the crisis in education approaches an education and judgment from a different but related direction. Arendt's main idea here is the essence of education is what she calls natality, which is not only an introduction of new humans to life, this complex and contradictory human-made world, both cultural and political, that the child must learn to navigate, but also that this world is only renewable, that lines of history can only be broken and deviated by the appearance by the appearance of new and unforeseen actions and ideas. Simply put, uh, humanistic education aims at providing the conceptual and cultural resources for cultivating the freedom in which, in which the possibility and potentiality of the new finds a space of appearance in the world. Like her friend, Walter Benjamin, for Arendt, witnesses to history are sensitive to the fact that historical experience is marked less by its continuities than by the intellectual occurrence of emergency situations where both common sense and a common reality have become fragile to the point, um, fragile to the point of disintegration. Thus, Arendt writes, we are always educating for a world that is or is becoming out of joint. Because the world is made by mortals, it wears out. And because it continuously changes its, its inhabitants, it runs the risk of becoming as mortal as they. To, observe the to preserve the world against the mortality of its creators and inhabitants, it must be constantly set right anew. The problem is simply to educate in such a way that a setting right remains actually possible, even though it can, of course, never be assured. Our hope always hangs on the new, which every generation brings. But it is precisely because we base our hope only on this, we destroy everything if we so try to control the new that we, the old, uh, can dictate how it looks. Um, and education and judgment is one of the most important tasks of the humanities, because here one prepares oneself and others both within and across generations to respond imaginatively and critical, critically to the emergency situations in which we find ourselves, while forging new ethical terms for lives held in common. In the past 3,000 years, it may well be that philosophy has taught us nothing conclusively, but perhaps through philosophy and the artful giving and receiving of judgments, we have learned how to learn. Thank you. Thank you so I am happy to, apparently we're going to alternate taking questions from the audience and taking questions from online. Yes, please. We have a question from <clears throat> some of our online participants. Um, how can we think about a possible connection between racism and judgment as you've described it? Meaning, is it possible to identify one's personal biases and racism when practicing judgment? Or is judgment completely free of racism? 
I ask this question since our concept of judgment looks to 18th century thinkers like Kant, whose idea of uh, universal was based on racial and or white supremacy. Yeah, I mean, one of the beauties of working with Hannah Arendt, which came to me as a, as a great surprise, is her, um, despite her great respect for Kant, um, undermining what it, well, well, two things, <laughs> undermining two key points that are in Kant's critique of judgment. One of which is that it's somehow unique and individual. Um, uh, responding, or, or responding to perhaps a false sense of universality, but Kant's ideas about judgment are, when you first go, whoa, that's beautiful, you want everybody to accept. But of course, Kant is also aware that the first thing that happens is someone standing next to you going, really? <laughs> and so I, th I think Arendt has been brilliant to bring out, and I hope I help her bring this out, how, what judgment is always leading to both, is always leading to both consensus and dissensus. Now, um, it's funny that this question was asked because apparently there's a big, uh, there was a big conference in Berlin recently about what, is, is Kant a racist? <laughs> well, he's got a lot of blind spots. But around the question of racism, what I, I think is most important is for, um, I mean, white people and black people have to engage together. And at, at least this is happening to some degree in the Black Lives Matter movement. One has to find a way for a conversation to take place. Um, and the, the worst thing that can happen is that there's walls built rather than um, finding ways to communicate together. That is such a long, long process between whites and blacks since the time of the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, and it progresses slowly, but I think it's something very important. I hope that responds to the question. I'm not quite sure it did. More questions from the audience? I love to talk. <laughs> yes, please. Concerned with universities being educational systems being dominated by corporate money. And of course, corporations are looking for transferable skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, to me, this is a very frightening situation. Mm -hmm. And, and there's always been a, an attitude, well, people go to college to get good jobs and make money. Yep. And down at the bottom of the ladder is uh, a few oddball people that study philosophy and history. And I, I, don't, I don't know whether it's getting worse or not. I have the impression that it is getting worse. Yeah. You know, there is a crisis in our educational system that needs to be addressed. Yeah. When do universities get rid of their history department. Yeah. I mean, this is insane. Is this a university or what the hell is it? Yep. I mean, this is where I think <laughs> parents and administrators should actually talk to people in, especially in the, um, the new technology industries um, that uh, also, I, I started thinking about this some time ago because my, my niece's husband <laughs> is a high tech entrepreneur. Um, and he does very well at it. And at the time I was talking to him, I was still teaching at Harvard. And he said, what's wrong with these Harvard kids? I said, what should be, what's wrong with them? And he said, well, they, they, they come and they you know, interview for jobs. I almost never hire them. And, he, and I said, why? He says, they have, they have no capacity for creativity. They, you know, they, they can't think out of the box. They're always, they're always looking to see, he asked me this question, what's the right answer to the question? And there is no right answer to the question. You know, my, the man just wanted to see how they think, if they could think creatively. And there's only one way. And the other example is I have students who, desperate, undergraduates who desperately want to be filmmakers. Um, and I tell them, well, you know what you should do? You should go take some history of our classes. <laughs> because I can teach anybody how to work cameras. I can teach a monkey how to work cameras, but I can't take, teach anybody how to make art. And, and so you get that capacity, not necessarily in a film production class, but in history classes, poetry classes, um, art history classes, right? This, there's this, I, I, I've held in desperation in five different universities on two continents to this idea that, you know, 
there's no such thing as training a student to get a good job in a university. That is a fantasy, you know, and yet it has somehow become a directive for, for, for some parents and some administrators. I feel freer from that at Chicago than I have at, at other places. Um, but, um, you know, to, to, to have imagined, to broaden one's experience of the world, to have an appreciation for talking to others and to problem solve with others. Um, you, you learn this in any kind of humanities class. That's something common to them all for me. And if only, <laughs> if only um, this would be, be more valued. Um, because I think the, these other metrics, when I taught in England, it was worse than, much worse than here. Um, it, it, it's something to report to the government that you've done this with students, but it does not help students to thrive and have jobs. So that's my editorial <laughs> on that subject. <laughs> I mean, my own daughter is going to law school, and she's thrilled to have studied anthropology and sociology as the basis for going to law school. So, yes, sir. Uh, can you expand on your statement that uh, st that science is not political? but humanities are. Uh, was that what you really said? Yeah, I mean, what? <laughs> this is, um, you, 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 have to, you have to be a true Arendt believer. I think they're really good down that, that rabbit path. I mean, in a point of fact, to the extent that any action impacts upon society, it's going to be political. So, uh, but Arendt has a very specific definition of politics which comes down to individuals acting in concert uh, with one another uh, to um, uh, achieve um, some kind of transformation, right? Um, cert certainly, I'm sure there are many science scientists who are political like that, but they are not um, in the, you know, they're, they're not, the difference is, is that the, the sciences which are great, I'm a kind of science nerd myself, but they um, are, are not necessarily practicing individuals in the same um, <laughs> set of activities that are defined by judgment. And I think that's what, I think that's what Arendt means, right? Um, you're you're, you might be the most highly trained uh, chemical biologists in the world, but it probably won't help you um, organize a demonstration <laughs> in the same way that some of these other uh, activities might. Um, so I think that's part of what she means. Yeah. And also the fact that um, this idea of, that we were talking about in terms of trying to preserve history, right? Um, the sciences have another job to do, thank heaven, since someone like me has got triple Pfizer now. <laughs> I couldn't have that without science. but. Um, but, but the, the humanities also have the job of pre preserving our past and our interpretive relationships to our past, which is a, a different kind of research, I guess I would say, than the sciences. Looks like I'm getting thrown out of here. <laughs> but I certainly thank you all for coming. Um, it was a very enjoyable conversation with me. And, um, and uh, if, if they have a few copies around, my book should be on sale at the co-op. So. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.